not everything here is publicly endorsed by RC National. Um, we like to investigate all concepts and let you decide. So not everything we're going to say and go over tonight uh, may or may not be, in, like, I guess, accepted uh, by the national branch. But that's okay. You're here to make your own opinion and your own beliefs. Um, not an organization make them for you. So, you know, free will. Woohoo. We love that. Um, additionally, we call our little segments Think Theism. And we have some trippy vaporwave stuff that I didn't make. I think Zach made it. So if you enjoy vaporwave, it, oh, sorry, my bad. Andrew made it, okay? Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about atonement, in case you don't know what that is. Um, I didn't know what it was. I grew up next to a church called Our Lady of the Atonement. So I just thought it was a church. It's not. It's the um, doctrine of the way we are restored to God. And so the book we're going over tonight is This Atonement and the Death of Christ by William Lane Craig. He is an apologetic and a professor. I believe he used to be at Biola and is now at Baylor. He stopped at and HBU. HBU, that's the other one. Um, super renowned philosopher, scholar um, in terms of religious studies. So highly recommend checking out this book. It is blowing my mind and he's like 18 times smarter than me. So, you know, it's cool to like learn from wise people. Um, so apologetics and atonement. We're going to be talking, first we're going to kind of go through a history of the idea of atonement and what that's looked like over the entire biblical period. So everything from way Old Testament to New Testament, you know, it's like we're going over the whole Bible. It's kind of nifty. Um, so what is atonement? It's actually not a Hebrew or Greek word like you would think. It's a Middle English word um, that is basically, as you can see on the screen, it means at one minute. And so it means to be restored um, to God. The most, I guess, the closest you can get to it is the Greek word uh, katalage, um, which means reconciliation and being reconciled to God. Um, and that is what Paul will use in his writings, um, Peter will use in his writings, etc., etc. Um, but it means to be restored in relationship with God, right? Um, and so 2 Corinthians 5.19 um, said that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. And so, as you can see, they use the catalogue word twice in there um, to talk about how the human race is restored to God. Um, so, atonement is, in a nutshell, basically the idea that God came down as a human, was nailed to a cross, and somehow that paid for our sins, and now we get to live in heaven, right? It's kind of that vague idea, and I feel like even a lot of Christians don't have a good grasp on, like, the way that works. Um, and so... It starts with sacrifice, right? And so in the Old Testament, we see tons of accounts of sacrifice in Levitical law, um, which is the law that the Hebrews abided by. Um, sacrifice was an annual thing, if not more frequently. And they had a couple of different traditions with that. And so one of the main ones is the laying on of hands. And so the sacrificer, the offerer, would walk up to the lamb that he's about to sacrifice and lay his hands on the head um, before the animal is killed. And that is an idea, basically... Obviously, it doesn't have any real power, um, but is a, re a representation of this man or woman identifying with the sacrifice. And so laying the hands on the head saying, this should be me. Um, if you want to go New Testament, Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. Um, and so as we sin, the just punishment of God is to kill us. And that death means eternal separation from God. Um, and so the Israelites way back when are recognizing that even before Romans is written and are identifying themselves with the sacrificial lamb because they realize that their place is on the altar. Um, so there was, I believe it was at, not a Passover. Um, what's the other one? It's blanking me right now. Yes. Yes, that's it. Um, on Yom, Yom Kippur, um, what they would do is the priest would have two sacrifices, right? One in which he would go in and sacrifice on the altar and atone for the sins of Israel. The second would be a, a sheep or a goat that they would essentially drive out of Jerusalem and into the desert. And this was symbolically, it's where we get the word scapegoat. Um, the sins are put onto this goat and they are driven away from the population of Israel. So one, the first one you sacrifice, right? You identify with and you sacrifice to I guess, pay for the sins of Israel. And the other one is a representation of how the sin, because of that sacrifice, has been removed from Israel. 
at least for the current time being, until the next time somebody sins, which is about 30 seconds later. Um, so it's symbolic, and it is not redemptive at all. Um, so a lot of people will be like, you know, you need to sacrifice every time you sin, like you need to kill a dove, you need to kill a sheep. Um, there's no power in the blood of a sheep. If you go hunting, it doesn't mean you have eternal salvation. I'm sorry. Um, so rats, right? Um, but it's symbolic, and it's, like I said, identifying with the animal, um, and that is our place as sinners, and then following that up and how our sin is removed um, from us when we're forgiven by God. Um, so the second branch of history that goes over atonement, you might have heard this passage before. It's a banger. Um, Isaiah 53, specifically verses 4 through 6. And I know this is bad presentation skills, but I'm going to turn around and read it off the slide because it's really good. Um, Surely he, this is all talking about Christ, prophesying for Christ. Um, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Um, So essentially what this is saying is this is a couple hundred years before Jesus. Um, We have carbon dated accounts that this was written down word for word um, hundreds of years before Jesus walked the earth. Um, And if you read the rest of the passage, it prophesies a crucifixion. And um, pierced for our transgressions, right? Nails through the hands, nails through the feet, pierced in the side. Um, And it shows that the idea of a Messiah coming to take on the sin of the world. And so Jesus is somehow suffering for our sins, is what this passage is communicating. Um, And so this is still kind of setting the precedent and revving up for the actual gospel and the actual crucifixion um, of Jesus. And sort of sets the stage um, for it to come about. Um, so, kind of marrying these two, um, we, uh, it's Leviticus meets Isaiah, which is cool, because, you know, the Bible works together, and I love it. Um, so, we have identified ourselves as believers um, living after the New Testament, um, or in the New Testament, in Revelation, um, with the Lamb of Christ, right? And so, we are the Israelite, putting our hands on the head of Christ, showing that we identify with Jesus and we recognize that Jesus' place is where we should be. Um, And through God's good grace and mercy that we're going to discuss here in a minute um, is the only way that that sacrifice actually has any atoning um, weight for our our sin. Um, So it is our punishment that we deserve, um, but by God's good grace, we have a way out. Right, so does anybody have... Now that we're kind of done with the historical stuff, anybody got any questions, thoughts, comments, criticisms, qualms? What's up? Why did Jesus have to be a sacrifice rather than a scapegoat? Um, In one way, he was both. Uh, The scapegoat is merely a representation to show that the sins of Israel were gone from within them, but that's only enabled via the first goat or the first sacrifice, which would essentially have the cleansing property um, for the nation of Israel, symbolically, of course. And so Jesus actually brings the legitimate cleansing property about. um, And so he does remove the sin from us, but it's not because we ought to drive him into the desert. It's because he paid the price um, for our sins. And I'm out of water. Anybody else? No? All right. So... Now, atonement is a very vague thing in Scripture. Um, You try to track down passages, and there's like 30,000 different metaphors for it. And you're like, what do I think? You don't know. Um, So now we're going to spend a little bit of time, a couple minutes, going over kind of the development of doctrine of atonement um, over the past 2,000 years and plus. So a couple of different theories. There's, in this book, highly recommend reading it, there's like 25. It was so, there were so many. Um, like every other like church father has one. And so I picked out a couple that I think are interesting representations, if not opposite representations. Um, so the first one is the Christus Victor theory. And basically it's that Christ's righteousness and life um, 
it's, it's kind of a ransom, right? And so Jesus lives the perfect life and go, goes down to hell. Um, Satan's in hell, and he's like, ooh, look, like Jesus is here, like perfect. God laid, him, laid his life down. Um, and like the price for human lives are paid, but I get Jesus. Um, and so he sets the captives free, right? Sets the humans free um, and takes Jesus. But then Jesus is like, ha, psych, you're the trickster, and you got tricked, um, and resurrects himself three days later. And so he, in that brings victory over um, sin, death, and Satan. Um, so that was a really early atonement view. A more developed one, <laughs> which is interesting, uh, is the moral influence theory. And the moral influence theory is basically that the cross has literally no power, which is like, huh? Um, blew my mind. Okay, um, I'm not endorsing this, but <laughs> basically the idea behind the moral influence theory is that Jesus' righteousness and the way he walked through his life perfectly and even humbly to go to the cross should inspire us to understand and feel the love of God and then respond by living out righteous lives um, and walking in holiness and goodness and redemption with God, right? And so it's like, whoa, that's against every orthodox doctrine I've heard. Um, But that's cool. So... Two different theories, very parallel opposites. One, Satan's, or Jesus is a trickster and tricks Satan. The other one, the cross has no meaning. Um, and so my point with this and these two polar opposites is that atonement theory is like a gym, right? And so a gym is, a diamond is cut with tons of different sides and you can look through it in different ways. Um, and so atonement is like this. And you'll see in the scriptures, there's tons of different metaphors um, for atonement. And it's multifaceted. And another point with that is if, because this is an apologetics, not course, um, organization, and what we do is we debate. And so if you want to pick apart one theory of the atonement, just because you disprove the moral influence theory doesn't mean you've disproved all of atonement. Sorry to burst your bubble. Um, There's about 25 other theories to disprove first, right? Um, And so in terms of talking about that, it's to show that this kind of gym-like structure of atonement doesn't necessarily collapse if you pop one balloon, right? Um, yeah, interesting theories. Some of them are... Mm. Um, so any questions, comments, or thoughts? Does anybody want to convert to the moral influence theory? What's up? How many of the early theories were considered heretical by the early church? Um, like, like, are, like, the theories we're considering, were these views that the church, like, throughout the years generally thought was right? Or are these like a bunch of ideas that popped up early on and eventually died out? So the way it worked is, in the book, you can read more on this if you'd like. He went through the early church fathers, the medieval times, and the reformers. And at each time, obviously, just like now, there were people that held different sides. Okay. And so one so would... It's all like a church father, like approved, big, uh, big deal Christians arguing. Stuff. Yeah, and so this is, these are significant philosophers. It's not like Benny in his garage. Um, and like they're like debating and wrestling with this in their time. It's not like, oh, well, he was wrong 3,000 years ago. What's up, Ben? So just to address that question from moral influence theory, um, big philosopher, definitely. Um, Orthodox, no, in many ways. Um, Peter Avalar is the chief um, proponent of that theory. Uh, where to start with Avalar? Heretic. Heretic. <laughs> um, he wasn't a church father, was he? Oh, no, he was right yeah. before Aquinas. He was yeah. in medieval. Medieval. Yeah. So he... Um, he was castrated he, after, <laughs> after, after basically raping a... Uh, yeah. Oh, a, dear. A, a Not really a great guy. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, so, but he was just as big of a theologian as Aquinas, right before Aquinas, to the people at the time. Yeah. But obviously Aquinas lived... That's quite he, the fruit of the spirit <laughs> there. A, yeah. um, Aquinas lived a much more virtuous life, and therefore his theories were much more easily accepted. Thank you. But that being said, the moral influence theory still has weight today in certain, especially like uh, more mainline Protestant circles um, on kind of the edges. Uh, So not necessarily orthodoxy, uh, but it also hasn't gone away, um, even though it hasn't really been accepted. Yeah, I would also say that these theories aren't necessarily 100% wrong. Like, Christ going to the cross doesn't kindle a love for God and believers and make us respond by wanting to obey his commands. Like, that's not wrong. That's orthodox. 
Um, and so it's not completely wrong, but if you tell me that the cross has no value, I'm going to tell you to read the Bible because you're wrong. Um, what's up? Is there any actual scripture that goes along with more like the police theory of like the, the cross not meaning anything? Um, I can look at Revs because he references well, something. Got Paul, if, if Christ didn't die for our sins, you know, we're to be pitied the most amongst everyone. So. But if no, Christ is not raised, raised, raised from the dead. Raised yeah. from the dead, yeah. 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 Uh, so one, one of the main ones would be looking to have this mind in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but humbled himself, taking on the form of a servant. Yeah. So in this case, Paul is saying, Jesus humbled himself all the way, uh, taking on a form of a servant, unto shameful death, and you should also be like that. So, so Philippians 2 explicitly is like Paul saying, be like Christ in his suffering. Yeah. And what was the, uh, the, the chapter and... Verse number Philippians, Philippians. Two, 9 through 11. Okay. I wonder if an argument for the moral influence theory, not that I agree with it, but could have something to do with the fact that, like you mentioned in the Old Testament, sacrifices were not inherently redemptive. So if that would imply that Christ's sacrifice was not redemptive, like I wonder if that would be one that's a, for it. That's a fair point. I feel like that would contradict the majority of Paul's teaching, but very fair point if you want to cherry pick. Um, any other thoughts, comments? Cool. All right. So now the fun part, right? Philosophy, okay? So with all the different doctrines of atonement and all the different metaphors we see in Scripture, um, there's not like a, hey, this is plan A, plan B. This is step one, two, three, right, um, of atonement doctrine. Um, so we need to take what we know about the nature of God. We need to take what we know about the way the world works, and we kind of use that as a lens to look at atonement and see if something makes sense. Like if we're going to claim God is just, um, but he'll punish an innocent person, is that justice? Right? Um, so looking at things like that, kind of through a worldly lens, um, not to say that you should take scripture and morph it to your ideology, because that's wrong. Um, but going off that note, like using the world we know to look at scripture, right? Um, so penal substitution is probably the most widely accepted and orthodox um, atonement theory. And it's the basic idea that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross takes the place of the punishment that we ought to have endured um, for our sins, right? And that in some way redeems us and saves us, right? And uh, pays our price, right? So that's going to be the idea we're looking at, and we're going to kind of take a diff couple different approaches. So penal substitution means that Jesus died in our place, Right? So first we want to ask the question, is there, is there a reason to believe someone can die in someone else's place as punishment for the other person, right? And so we see this in Moses. In Exodus 32, 30 through 34, if you want to go read it, um, the Israelites are worshiping a golden calf, and Moses is so upset, and God's, God's so angry with the Israelites that he wants to strike them down um, because they're idolizing and worshiping a false god. And Moses instead is like, no, take me, take my life, and spare them. And God's like, no, that's dumb. We're not going to do that right now. You're just a human. Um, and so we see this idea, this, this idea of sacrificing our lives for another's wrongs way back in Exodus, um, which is the second book of the Bible. And so this is something that was culturally apparent at the time. Um, and like, there's a couple different other different instances if you want to go look into those. Um, but it's not something that's unprecedented at 0 AD, right? Um, so the core counter-argument against penal substitution is six steps, right? If God is perfectly just, right, then he can't punish an innocent person. Therefore, um, I'm sorry, Christ was an innocent person. That's supposed to be bullet number three. Um, therefore, God can't punish Christ. And if God can't punish Christ, penal substitution is false. Right? So God can't harm an innocent person for something they didn't do. And Jesus didn't do anything. God harmed him, apparently under penal substitution. So it can't be right. Um, that's the base argument. But um, I would also take the sidestep argument that just because someone is innocent doesn't mean they can't be punished for wrongs. Um, you want to look at our imprisonment rate for um, false, false accusations. Like, go ahead. What's up? see innocent individuals punished all the time, but that's not just. Like, yeah, yes, yeah, it's not just at all. 
But the, the idea is it's not logically impossible, right? Like, yeah. like it's not totally impossible. It's not unheard of. Um, and so we're just going to start to break that down a little further. Um, that didn't go. There we go. Questions, thoughts, comments? Anything else? Okay. Um, so the idea that Christ is punished for our sins can kind of tick some people off because punishment is supposed to, there were four grounds that they set out for it in the book. And it's the idea that it's to impose some hardship on someone intentionally because they did wrong and to send a message to others, right? So think about a murder case. Someone gets imprisoned because they did something wrong intentionally by an authority um, to send a message that you shouldn't murder people. What a concept. Um, and so that's kind of the grounds they lay out for punishment. And so by saying Christ is punished for our sins, um, that can, if you use that definition, it can kind of trigger some people. So all, really easy pro-life hack that all you have to do right here is you replace the word punishment with penalty. Um, penalty, you think like a fine or you know, a civil lawsuit, right? Um, you can have a penalty that an innocent person pays for a guilty person, right? Like if my parents pay my speeding ticket, they didn't speed, but they're paying my penalty. Um, so that's a really easy way to sidestep the argument without invalidating it. Um, now, another concept, if you don't want to sidestep it with the idea of penalties, is imputation, right? And um, this is going off of Galatians 3.13, which says that Christ became a curse for us when he took on our sin. And you're like, oh, God became a curse. That's weird. Um, and then there's also a scripture that he who knew no sin became sin. And so this idea of God, Jesus, becoming something sinful. Um, and obviously we know it's not in his character to do wrong if God is perfect and just. Um, and so you're like, how do I reconcile this? Right? And it's this idea of imputation. And so there's a thing called vicarious liability that we see all the time in our current courts of law. And the basic idea is if there's an employer, he's held liable for the action of his employees. And so um, they gave the example of a bartender selling alcohol to a police who was on duty. Um, and the owner of the bar had to pay for it because he had the license to sell alcohol and the bartender wasn't punished, right? Um, so because the authority figure is wrong. They sometimes catch the liability even if they didn't do the act, um, if that makes sense. And so we see this all the time in our courts. Um, they list a couple different cases in the book. If you want to follow up on the after, I can cite them for you. Um, but it's not a failure on the part of the employer. It's solely because of their relationship to the wrongdoer that they have to pay the price, right? Um, and so this liability is replicated. So just because the bartender sold the alcohol, it doesn't mean he gets off scotch-free. Ha, scotch. Um, and he, it's okay. It's a bad joke. Uh, <laughs> so just because he, he sold it doesn't mean he gets off free. Um, what it means is that the liability is replicated in the employer. It's not just transferred, right? So he's not guiltless anymore, but now the employer has to deal with it and pay the, the fee, basically. Um, so thus, the employer can be liable for punishment and is held guilty to it. Yes? So I definitely want to maybe go through a few more of those cases that Rebs, mm -hmm. because my first thinking... That one? Yeah. yeah. Uh, my first thinking is that uh, if I were to, to punish the employer, it would be because of some sort of legitimate uh, objection, like, oh, you didn't train your employee properly. Uh, so I'm not sure if there are any cases where it really was the employee who was at fault. Um, they had received the proper training and whatnot, but... Yeah, I, I, I agree with Sam here. I think in, in most cases, when we think, like, if you actually, like, get a, give an example and think about what your into moral intuition is about the situation, in the cases where you agree with the vicarious liability, Usually it's because there is, it's not just that because it's an employee, therefore the employer bears the guilt, but, but there is some kind of responsibility, right? So, for example, uh, an 18-wheeler gets in an accident, and it makes sense that the company bears some of the responsibility, and especially like if the, if the driver wasn't you know, impaired or something, 
sometimes accidents happen, and if you're a trucking company, you bear the responsibility for sometimes you're going to have an accident, and you're responsible for that, for managing that outcome, right? So it's, I, I don't like these arguments in general because I think it's, it's weird to me to take the quirks of our own legal system, which personally, and I think most people agree with me, is significantly flawed in many cases, and then trying to argue from those examples to our moral intuitions about God. I think mm -hmm. probably our moral intuitions themselves are going to be more reliable than our examples of law. Yeah, I, I think the I think the point is actually a whole lot more reserved than this because I think if you're trying to make the like one to one comparison to vicarious liability, you know, some element of Western tort law is exactly identical to this element in Christian theology. I, I think that you're you're correct in that. I think what the purpose of it is is to build up the intuition that the notion of responsibility is a lot broader than one person does one action and then that one person is wholly responsible for the consequences of that one action. Mm -hmm. I, I think that is... That makes a lot more sense. Where, I think that's where it's getting, and vicarious liability is an example in, in Western tort law that is like particularly, I guess, sharp, because in this case, like, the, the liability is a one-to-one -one correspondence to somebody who might not have even been at the scene of the, the, the occurrence. But, but that argument then would suggest that Jesus was crucified because he was actually appropriately responsible for the actions of people and that he was the, like that that was the appropriate punishment, not just a, you know, I mean, we think of the atonement as grace, something undeserved, something that's in a sense all legal, right? That it's not illegal, but it's, it's actually not what the law would say Fossil, well, in that right? case, we're not dealing with vicarious liability. We're dealing with uh, optional liability. Well, yeah, and that's where I think this breaks down. Like, when, a, when an employer is responsible for their employee, it's because they actually bear some responsibility for the negative consequence. Jesus didn't bear any of the responsibility for the, the for sin, right? Well, I, I, but that is the argument, right? Like, that just is the claim that, like, he who knew no sin willingly became sin on our behalf. He became, you could look yeah. at it like he's, if he's the second Adam, you know, the first Adam gave us original sin, if you buy into that. Well, if Jesus is the second Adam, he's representing humanity's sinfulness. Or he, he's the representative just like the employer is representing, or the company is representing the employees. I mean, he's taking that on. He's taking on being the representative human. I, I think that the, the purpose of this is really just to be like almost a not, not a one-to-one -one analogy, but like a better analogy, because typically, you know, like what, what's the, the, the mean version of this is like, you know, you got in an accident, you got a ticket, but somebody paid your ticket for you, but there's no relationship between you and a person paying your ticket, right? Like that's, and, but in this case, it's saying like the reason the liability is replicated between these two people is because of a formal, like contractual relationship between the two, which is roughly analogous to what Christian theology is asserting is that there is like a covenantal relationship between Jesus and the sinner, or Adam and his progeny, or whichever one you want to say in that case. I'm kind of getting thrown off with the use of replicate here because uh, if we're taking replication, that would mean that the um, like once the payment is done, whether that be for the um, act like the accident or the bartender, um, that would mean that then the bartender would also have to pay that, and then there would be a double um, liability as opposed to a single, which is being covered. Yes. So that's the next point. Why replication? Like, um, so I guess the idea would be just because someone pays the thing doesn't mean you're not guilty mm -hmm. in the first place. Like it, with the speeding ticket analogy, if someone paid my speeding ticket, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm, I wasn't guilty of speeding, right? And so it just means that the, whoever paid my ticket was held accountable for my mistake, right? But replicated liability would mean that you both have to pay the penalty, right? Not that one person pays and the other person doesn't pay. Yeah. That's why I was not mm -hmm. <laughs> Then that's the next point, though. Okay. Um, so the next point, this one. Um, 
So that because our sin is imputed and passed off to Christ, right, replicated in Christ, he then is, quote-unquote, legally liable um, to pay our price, right? Like with the, the idea of the speeding ticket, like he pays the penalty. Um, and it's representational of us. It's where we are supposed to stand. Um, we're supposed to be on the cross, right? Think back to the Israelites laying their hands on the head of the sheep. Um, but he voluntarily went to the cross instead. Um, and when he was punished, we were representationally punished as he was our representative. Uh, an analogy would be, you know, think like any form of like Senate, like you have a representative in the Senate. And so their actions reflect your actions as your representative. Um, and so it satisfies God's need um, for justice. And it, let me make sure it's not on this slide before I say it. Um, yeah, okay. So because we are condemned criminals that stand before Christ, and then Christ then intercedes for us, um, there's two levels of imputation, right? So our sin and our guilt is imputed to Christ, and he takes on our liability, right, the vicarious liability thing. Um, but then his righteousness is imputed to us, right? So it's a, it's a two-way street. And so it's not necessarily that like, oh, now I'm just kind of neutral before God. It's the righteousness of God is attributed to us when we stand in Christ and when we believe in Christ, right? And so this idea of like, that's, that is where the analogy breaks down of you don't have to like double pay the ticket or whatever. Um, but Christ then imputes his righteousness to us. So while we were guilty, his perfection is now upon us. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so that's a perfect way. Um, so that's a divine pardon, right? Um, and so again, trying to draw the comparison between our current legal system, not a perfect legal system, um, is that the righteousness of Jesus is imputed to us um, and we have the righteousness of God. Um, but then the remedial justice, this was an interesting topic that got my gears turned, is when we, when in our courts, when we punish or when we pardon criminals, there's in a lot of cases, I think it's like after a certain degree of crime, you have to wait five years after they've served their punishment um, before you pardon the criminal in a lot of U.S. courts, right? I don't, and so basically after, say like after their five years jail time, you have to wait another five years um, before you can pardon them and restore their civil rights back to them. So if a judge decides to pardon you right as a convicted criminal, you can't vote, right? And so if you want your voting rights restored, you have to be pardoned. And you're restored to your nature as a citizen of the U.S., right? I um, mean, you can refuse this pardon. It, you don't have to accept it. Um, and you can choose to just not have your civil rights if you're into that, I guess. Um, <laughs> I would imagine you'd want to. Um, but it's the same idea when you take it on a divine scale. Right? And so we have the righteousness of Christ imputed to us, and that is our divine pardon. And instead of civil rights and voting rights, right, we get the right to be a child of God imputed to us in this pardon. Right? And one would say, right, we were talking about this idea of double payment for a punishment. Right? With, um, when we are restored to our rights, Jesus has paid the punishment, just like in a civil court case, someone has paid their fight, like done their jail time, right? So the punishment's been paid, whether by Jesus or, you know, by your jail time. And then after that, then the pardon comes and you're restored to your status, right? Or I guess we technically weren't restored, but that's cool. Um, and so we are restored to righteousness with Christ, right? And to be a child of God and inherit eternal life and to be one that gets to dwell in the kingdom um, and gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, right? And so it can, it's obviously a broken analogy because our judicial system isn't perfect, um, but there's the same kind of common link of the punishment being paid. In our case, it's paid by Jesus. Um, and then after the justice is satisfied, right? Because God is perfectly just. In his mercy, he provided Christ, right? So he's perfectly loving. Um, after his justice is satisfied, then we get this restorative divine pardon, right, that brings us to this status. Does that make sense? Does that help kind of even out the imputation idea we had a second ago? Right? 
I think the, the pardon analogy is, makes a lot more sense to me. Because it's almost extrajudicial in a sense. I just wanted to clarify what you're saying to make sure I'm understanding. Maybe I'm not understanding it. Um, understand what you're saying. Um, the so the first step is um, the part or the um, taking the penalty, so yes. taking away the eternal punishment for right. sin, and there's a step after that of restoring us to be in full communion with God and to be able to participate in the provision. So right. there are two steps there. Yes. Okay. Um, uh. This might be a question for Rex, but I'm interested in how that works under Protestantism. Because it seems that, being blunt, Catholics have a perfect answer for that. That the second step happens in, pur- in purgatory, and it's perfectly logical, because this is the way that atoning sin worked out. Boo, um, boo, purgatory. Well, that's, it's the and death that, and then the resurrection. There's, that's step one is death, you're buried in Christ. Step two is you're raised with Christ. Yeah. He rises from the dead. Um, I guess the Protestant view, it wouldn't be like purgatory. Um, it'd be your saving faith in Christ, right? That you are restored to a kingdom of God, right? Right, but that's the, the, the first, that would just cover the first step, right? And no, really so the, the restoration is the second step. So the penalty is paid by Christ on the cross, like his blood on the cross, that's the penalty, right? So then that's taken care of. Um, but that is done whether or not you or I believe in Christ. And so if no one believes in Jesus after that, then the penalty is still paid. Right, so step one's taken care of, but nobody gets to benefit from it. So we accept the pardon when we come to faith in Christ, and we get that new life. So I, okay, that was misunderstanding. So first yeah, he was saying is, objective and subjective. In other words, the pardon can be refused, so if the pardon has to be received. But yes. The first step can't be refused, and it's done for everybody. So atonement right. is mm-hmm. universal right. under this view. Okay, yes. I wasn't. I didn't realize we had gotten the universal atonement already. No. Um, but that. That, that makes more sense. So okay. for everybody. Um, yes. So the punishment is paid, and then we get to choose whether to be restored. Um, it, it, it seems like as we jump back and forth between penalty and pardon, stuff starts to break down. For example, if, um, if the pardon is issued on the... I need to develop this question more. So. I, think what you're, I think what you're getting at is the, um, we tend to use pardon as like you get off scot-free, right? Yeah. Um, and the idea, kind of stealing it from our legal system, is that there is the punishment, which is where you serve your jail time, and then after your jail time, you are then pardoned, and you're restored to your civil rights, if that makes sense. So you're not pardoned is, away from... Is that really, though, the right terminology? Because... Sort of Usually like, we think of pardons as executive branch active, whereas like having your record cleared after you serve is expungement, maybe, or I don't know, maybe like at a county level or something, judges will pardon, but I don't... It's I don't sort of like that. if your twin went to jail for you, and then as soon as he got out of jail, he would still have all of his civil rights and stuff, because he, he's not actually... But, and then if you got a pardon afterwards... And you still can't vote? No, no, no. Then you, can't, then you also get your civil rights back. So then, so then two people have gotten their civil rights back. How did you get your though, twin to go to jail? Even though only one person... <laughs> really nice even though only one person went to jail. Sure. So we can call it expungement. We can call it pardon. <laughs> we can send your twin to jail if you have one. I don't. I'm unlucky, I guess. Um, so, hope I don't get arrested. I need to send my twin to RC. This is why I think though, that the... The legal system analogy is so tough because an expungement is not like an act of grace, right? To be expunged, you have to meet certain criteria. Like you said, it, usually they're going to wait. wait a certain number of t- certain amount of time after you have finished, you know, paying the penalty for what crime you committed, and it's at the discretion of a judge or something to grant that. Whereas a pardon is extrajudicial, and it's purely at the discretion of a the you know, the executive, right? Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, maybe somebody has a second thought. Uh, it's not extrajudicial in a monarch. In a monarch, you true. Can, can judge and the office of the executive are one and the same. Mm-hmm. This is true. But I, I have an even deeper worry about all this. Is that I'm not 
sure we're really in a position to object to any of this at all. I mean, justice is, at least legal justice, is a function of power. The most powerful being in the universe is God, so I don't know mm -hmm. how we're Whoa. in a position to <laughs> What? Sam. I'm not sure I can follow you there. Oh, my goodness. Well, another thing about pardoning, sometimes this may get the wrong impression because um, I know, I, I think I understand um, Islam a little bit that Allah doesn't require, you know, there's no atonement in Islam. There's no set, there's no um, rich, there's not, yeah. none of this substitutionary atonement. Um, Allah grants mercy or he doesn't. So it's, he, he gives a pardon or he doesn't, but there's no justice mm. for sin. Yep. So you work for your sin, you do, I mean, you do all of the five pillars, and then Allah grants you mercy if he does or if he doesn't, but there's no justice involved. Mm. And so I guess you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want, you can't have the pardon here unless the justice is satisfied. Uh, right. Is yes. Satisfied. So it's different from other views because actually substitutionary atonement is very restricted to Christianity. I think even after 70 AD, Jews don't even, I don't think in Judaism they have this idea now. Right? Post 70 AD? Do you know they didn't really have sacrificial? I mean, they had to figure out how to live without a sacrificial. Yeah, they don't, they, they describe it, I think they interpret it differently now, as far as I know when I've asked about it. So well, I, it's very uh, unique to Christianity, this idea. I know now Yom Kippur is um, taken more as a, like, uh, a restart to the, um, like, to how your previous actions and more of like, it is, it is still following the scapegoat idea of like yeah. passing on the sins of the last year and, and like how you've treated others, mm -hmm. um, but it's just without the direct sacrifice. Yeah, without the symbolism of, of having it. And it was taken. last week. Yeah. Kind of. yeah, it was like it was yeah. recently. It was last Thursday. Uh, yeah, it was last Thursday. Yeah. 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 I mean, don't quote me on this, but I do think part of modern Judaism, maybe this is a little bit morally conformed, but the idea is that the sacrifices are nowadays since we don't really have that system they're more of a symbolic thing like you sacrifice back then you may have sacrificed a lamb or a goat because you were a farmer and nowadays you might sacrifice just your money your time etc to god gotcha i don't know much about traditional judaism i want to learn about it but to kind of circle back to the original criticisms of you know, the technicalities of pardon one of the easiest ways to just kind of avoid that whole technicality discussion is just go, this is a bad analogy, but it's like this. And then just saying those words of, oh, yeah, I guess it is a bad analogy, so they won't attack it. And it's like mm. you're trying to make them understand the concept. Yeah. But if you say, if you start something outright saying it's a bad analogy, then you're never going to get anywhere with it because then you, there's no point in using it. Yeah, to have meaning. Well, no, the point of the analogy is to paint a picture of a concept, but it doesn't have to be a perfect and so you acknowledge it's not a perfect match, and then when someone goes, hey, it's not a perfect match, well, you, you kind of take that path of the discussion out. Yeah, the idea is just to derive a principle that, you know, would make one thing right or wrong when you're doing an analogy. Like, if you're saying, this is how a pardon works, then you're implying that there is some concept of pardoning someone, mm -hmm. and you're able to apply that, so yeah. you don't have to match exactly. It's just, you have to derive a concept from it. So, uh, I have a question, I, which I won't ask if we need to move on. So I'll let you um, I mean, all that I've left is takeaway slides, but this is the main okay. takeaway anyway, so. Well, I have a question. At, at some point, I, I think there's sometimes a sense in which both this view as well as like the ransom view comes across as like God being subject to some requirement. And he's kind of hampered. He, he would love to just forgive everybody, but he can't. He's not able to, so he has to do this convoluted, like, legal juggling in order to make something work to save people. Yeah. And so he goes through this weird process of, you know, sending Jesus and, and then dying on the cross, and right? Um, like this, like, it's, it's like he's navigating this arcane legal process, which is very much like, you know, the way we interact with the legal system in our world today, but I don't really think that that's what Paul is trying to communicate. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that's more a statement, but I'm just curious what everybody else thinks. Yeah, so 
So that's actually something I have a bit of a question and or not like not a full good understanding of is how does him dying on a cross make it so that way people can be atoned for or saved? Because it doesn't it doesn't seem to me that that would it actually fulfills what would normally be like the things I would really consider to be justice. So so let me ask you a question based off of that. Um, justice would be to pay the like to satisfy the demand for punishment, well, right? Justice so justice would end up involving I guess for me justice or punishments and those that kind of system serves a couple of different purposes, but I don't see it serving I don't see how it serves any of the purposes without making things that people wouldn't really agree with how God would fit in. Like, for instance, one thing when talking about earlier about the payment or the uh, uh, the employers being responsible for the employees uh, with fines, usually those types of things are meant to dissuade certain actions. Uh, so it's the payments and those things aren't those aren't necessarily directly meant to try and like hurt a specific person. It's meant to try and stop a specific action from happening. Mm -hmm. So payment coming out from somewhere or ha having a payment be required when a certain action takes place. It, this, this can, it's not necessarily going to be about mm -hmm. this, but. Um, I think but, what you're kind of going off of is this idea right here. Um, and that's, that's incorporated of. into the definition yeah. of punishment. You're saying like with the example of like the payment, it, it's, like, um, well, it's as a warning it, sign, right? Well, the main thing is it's supposed to dissuade people from doing a specific action because then they'll have to have the payment. Mm -hmm. But Jesus dying on a cross, I don't see how, especially with how, from what I understand, it seems to me that it's kind of inevitable that anyone's going to sin. And it seems to me inevitable, you know, people are going to, basically it seems to me that Jesus dying on the cross isn't, dissuading anyone, or it's not like people are going to have been dissuaded from sinning if Jesus, you know, or if the initial punishment of, we could even just use crucifixion mm -hmm. on them individually. Yes. Because. I would, I would agree with you. Christ so, being crucified doesn't necessarily stop right. us from sinning. Um, but I think we have a couple of definitions we need to get yeah, straight. Yeah, to, um, be, to be clear, I do think justice is more than just that. There's a couple of other yes. parts. Yes, I, I would say what, we're, what you're defining right now isn't justice. I think you're defining punishment, which is the exacting of justice. I think if we're going to talk about this, yes, I think we need to take a farther step back and say, what is justice? Okay. Right? And so what would you say justice is, like, definitionally? So I guess the couple of parts to justice that would be involved would be uh, helping restore a person of something that they were robbed of or lost. For instance, if mm -hmm. someone steals money from you, getting that yeah. money back would be part of that. Or if you get hurt due to workplace accident, getting payment of some kind. In so to, restoring you know. to an original status, okay. And then the other option, or this is, I guess this part might be more of with um, punishment, but the other part of it is a lot of punishment is, should be about, I don't know if it, this isn't always how it's enacted, but uh, justice should be about hoping to rehabilitate the person who was and did, like who did the wrong and understand how they did it, you know, yeah. what they did wrong and fix them. But I don't understand how Jesus dying on a cross does either of those things. Oh, um, that, so that's that's the part that you're describing the gospel. Um, so it, Jesus well, and dying. He's, he's <laughs> you're close. That, you're really he's, close. He's yeah. about to say something. Well, <laughs> the the part that I don't get here is. How, like, what does Jesus dying on a cross actually do to, like, restore us? Like, why was that? Yes. Or more, more, more specifically, why was that necessary for our restoration? Why couldn't God have gone, I see, for, like, I see you, you are trying really hard to be righteous. You're making mistakes and you're not succeeding, but you're trying very hard. And so I'm going to give you the ability to become righteous. Yes. And then Jesus dying, not necessary. Okay, so you're describing the gospel, you're just forgetting one little tiny bit. Um, and that tiny bit is retribution. Okay. Retribution, um, think Newton's third law, every action has an equal opposite reaction. Am I right on that, physicists? Check me. 
Uh, so, right, if we, so the idea, that's, that's physics, but the idea of retribution is if there's a wrong, that wrong needs to be righted, right? Like you were saying about restoring. So if someone yeah. steals, if Andrew steals $100 from me, in order to have the restoration of $100, the just thing to do would for him to give it back. And he gets $100 back. Yeah, and so, and that would be, in a sense, punishment and it's restoration, right? And right. it's retribution, okay? So. And so with something that isn't necessarily like a monetary sin, so say like a sin against okay. God, um, that so. isn't stealing God's checkbook, um, would be. Just unbelief in God. Unbelief in God. So I, I guess, yeah, I, I, I kind of see where you're going with yeah. this, so, but I'm not, yeah. I'm not saying I fully understand because I don't understand well, the point of. Keep, keep going. Well, it's, talk, you're talking about retribution needs mm -hmm. to be, but. I think that needs to be incorporated into the definition of justice. I don't understand, I, I guess I don't understand why. Um, like restoration, I understand, like restoration, I understand, dissuading from doing the action again, I understand, but why is retribution necessary? Wouldn't the retribution be the rehabilitation? That's not necessary. That's not, that's not, no. but you that's said not really when you, when you described justice, you, you, you had it then. Because you said the person needs to be... Um, they need to be restored. I, right? think, um, I think one thing is, um, one thing you're describing is aspects that our, our justice system in America specifically um, needs to incorporate more into our justice some system, does, right? So, the system, yeah. like the idea of restoring, so someone gets out of jail, like we have a recovery program for them, right? Something like that, a, a restoration. Um, but the they still had to go to jail in the first place, well, and that idea is a payment, a punishment for something that they did, and that is the retribution we're talking about. So something wrong deserves a payment in order for it to be made right. You know, like say if you send a murderer to prison, um, like they go to prison, they not not necessarily learn their lesson and be restored in prison, right? But you would still say like I want them off the streets, like I want them in prison. They need to serve their time. So, so that is right? another part of justice is helping. Well, keeping them off the streets isn't, and this is where I think the differences comes about. So. Keeping them off of the streets and having them be in prison isn't to me about forcing some retribution upon the person. In that case, it's about protecting the people from a person who's potentially dangerous. And then the place of, that jail should be or what jail should end up doing is be a place where people are rehabilitated into a place where they are able to come back into society. I agree. So I, but, can, I, can I propose a, an alternative way to think about this a little bit that mm -hmm. I think might move us one step further. So there's, there's two different things that we're talking about when we're talking about um, how to handle a crime that's been committed, right? There's rehabilitation and then there's retribution. These are opposites, right? They, they don't, one, they're not the same thing. So the rehabilitation is not the retribution. Correct. So the rehabilitation is how do you fix the person who committed the crime, right? Yeah, how do you make how it you so that they can go back into society? Back to their state. The retribution is how do you um, account for the fact that a wrong was done? And, and that, that's not just like restoring to the original state, that's actually paying for the crime in a, in a different sense, right? So, um, so when you cheat on an exam, you don't just get the grade that you would have gotten if you hadn't cheated, you get a zero. Right, that's retribution. Um, the restoration, then, you know, the you work with the professor and figure out how to still pass the course, right? So no, but so but think about this. Well, uh, the argument here is that to be just, you have to have both of these aspects because to allow an evil to be done and to not treat it seriously is not just. And on the other hand, uh, a just judge will also try to restore the evildoer, not just punish the crime, but also restore. And so the, the argument that's being made here is that this is what God did. In order to demonstrate the severity of the crime, Jesus actually paid the penalty. He, so like somebody actually died for the crime to show that it was like that this is a really serious thing, right? But, okay, so, so it satisfies justice, but at the yeah, same time, then, 
if if you as a sinner allow, then God will restore you. I mean, it's literally just it's this conversation. This is where I think because I think talking about the exam and talking about the retribution stuff there kind of is a good example of what I'm trying to explain or refer to. So the restorative act would be, as you said before, trying to make sure you don't cheat again, understand why cheating is wrong and pass the class. But getting a zero rather than the grade you would have gotten if you didn't cheat it to me isn't it? It's not a retribution act. That is a absolutely is. Well, to me, <laughs> that is that is a before. method. That's exactly. It right. is a method to discourage people from cheating and both. to it's make both. that behavior it's, it's decrease. It's a dual. That's it's what the purpose of both. It's both. to dis- it's a, to discourage people, okay. but it's also to to demonstrate the severity of the of right. the. Um, of the so, offense. I mean, if you go before the honor council, this is what so, they'll tell you. So, if getting a, if it was found out that getting a zero on an exam, like people getting zeros on exams, didn't decrease the likelihood that they would cheat, like it didn't serve that purpose, would still, that still be a good? Would, but, still be getting zeros. But, yes. say, I don't understand why people should get zeros at that point. Under the dis, under like trying to dissuade people under that argument, you don't have any cause for justice because like you can get up and yell at your students. And then, like, give the kid a hundred on the exam that he cheated on. That's the grade he earned, right? Like, he got a hundred. That's cool. I, but if I get up here and yell, I'm dissuading my entire class and making a scene of him, right? But he still gains from that. And people would say that's morally and objectively wrong, flat out. I, I hang on. I'm so, so sorry. It, I'm really confused how we jumped to yelling at a student. And well, because you're talking about wanting to dissuade, like, make an example of the student that cheated, okay. right? And if you want to make an example of the student, instead of just giving him a zero, right, because that's well, something he'll see on his own grade, like if you call him out in front of the class and embarrass him, that's a lot, it sends a much stronger message to the class, right? But under that, like justice is only to dissuade further action. Under that theory of justice, then yelling at the kid in front of the class does that job, but you have no reason to penalize the kid. So he should get the hundred that he cheated for and got. Well, no, under that. So, let me just restore it back to pre so, cheating grade. Right? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, in that instance, that w- that then becomes a debate or a talk about uh, what does and doesn't dissuade people from cheating. Why do those methods end up working? And we can no. <laughs> well, some some people do think that there should never be punishment. That it should all be about re- rehabilitation. But in, most people disagree with that. Well, so I, again, the part that I'm trying to understand and the part that I don't get is why a retribution has to occur. Like because they did work. like yeah. Actually, I think to give it to give a good example. Let, let's say someone ends up committing a horrible, heinous crime, like they end up killing someone. And then they end up developing amnesia, and they go about their lives, and they learn about this act that well, happened, this is, and they... This no. is going to be an edge case, so... Let's, well, let's talk about the... Well, here's, here's let's the, talk about here's the, the part cheating that I'm trying case. to highlight. This, this person is restored to the previous state, where they, they already understand that what they did, like this thing that happened was wrong, they're in society appropriately, they don't have any connection that they feel with this action. They're, you know, they basically don't even know that they're the one that committed it. And later on, they discover and yeah, they realize they, that they're the ones that committed the crime. That, Do they that's deserve... Equally, that's you can that's an edge that case. In either direction on under either, under either view. So it won't help us figure out the well, answer. The question the, is, what is the appropriate... Punishment they, for a crime, right? They commit. They committed the crime. They committed the murder. They committed murder. However, they already recognize that what they did is wrong. They are already acting in society in like a good and healthy way. So, what is the point then of throwing them into jail? Yes. Um, maybe it's I'm not, gonna. Maybe it would be inappropriate. I'm gonna That's put a little to, bit of a pin in this combo. Yeah. Do you have one thing, Dad? Oh uh, yeah. I think honestly, just to simplify this and maybe bring it a little bit further take another step is that God created Adam and Eve and they sinned and there was rebellion against God. God cannot be or have a relationship with someone that is imperfect who has sinned. Therefore, we are eternally separated from God. Like, we can't go to heaven if we are eternally separated from God. If we have sinned, we are imperfect. God is perfect. He can't be. We can't be like that. Right. Therefore, out of 
love for us and why in relationship with us, there had to be something that took up that separation that pretty much was so, the bridge from sin to God. So why, and I guess, and this is the part that is, like I'm trying to I'm going to, I'm going to put a pin. Why did that have to be? Sorry, go I'm going to put a pin in this because we're 10 minutes yeah, over and we're about to get kicked out. Um, oh, well, I mean, that was basically the takeaways conversation right there. Final takeaways. Um, in case you were wondering, uh, the death and resurrection of Christ are core parts of the atonement. Who would have guessed? Um, it's bigger than just God sacrificed himself to himself for our sin. Um, the Old Testament backs it up, and the New Testament authors prove that. Um, the main objection to penal substitution is that it doesn't work because it's unjust to punish someone that never did anything wrong. Um, and this objection takes multiple unwarranted assumptions. Um, such as legal innocence of Christ, um, which we can solve with imputation, and various other doctrines. Um, and penal substitution allow God to be both completely just and completely merciful in his character um, and doesn't violate his character at all. Therefore, penal substitution is theologically coherent um, and showcases the divine pardon and mercy of God. And we are about to have a mass exodus because we're like 15 minutes over, but... Revs downstairs. Let's continue the conversation. Okay? So, dinner.